Good evening. Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Sylvia Royster. I am the Director of Community Engagement and Equity here in Charles County Public Schools. Very excited, former fifth grade teacher. So very excited and very honored to be here this evening to be a part of this conversation. We know we have individuals that are with us tonight in person and then we have family members and students and staff and community members watching from home and different places in our community and we are so grateful. I guess I'm just a little overwhelmed. I mean, just having these panelists here, we just have a wealth of history and that is why you are here. So I would like to welcome everyone today to join us in an evening of learning, the African-American experience from segregated to integrated schools in Charles County. At this time, I would like to take a moment to recognize our elected officials and our many distinguished guests for joining us and to thank you for the continued support for our students and our families and our staff members here in Charles County Public Schools. As I call your name, please stand at this time to be recognized. Board Chairperson Yanelle Moore Lee. <laughs> Board Vice Chairperson Nicole M. Kramer. <laughs> Board Member Michael K. Lucas. <laughs> Board Member Jamila Smith. <laughs> Board Member Brenda Thomas. Board member Samiche Thomas. <laughs> Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Maria Navarro. <laughs> and at this time, the Honorable Ralph E. Patterson II, Vice President, Charles County Commissioners. <laughs> the Honorable Gilbert B.J. Bowling III, Charles County Commissioner. Charles County Health Officer, Deanna E. Abney. <laughs> Chief of Schools, Dr. Marvin Jones. <laughs> and I know that we are going to have additional um, elected officials with us this evening. My apologies. We have an additional member with us. Board member, Jamila Smith. Oh, I got you. Board member Linda Warren. Thank you. I would also like to recognize the following special guests who are joining us today. Please stand to be recognized. Members of the Charles County NAACP Board of Directors. Please stand, thank you. Members of the Pamunkey High School Alumni Association. Members of the Charles County African American Historical Society. And members of the Charles County Historical Society. I must say that the opportunity to be able to collaborate on this program has really been encouraging and promising. And some of the conversations that have been had with our panelists that are with us tonight our distinguished guests and our VIPs that are in the audience are really gonna propel us forward for additional conversations to elevate the voices that you're hearing tonight and then some. The opportunity to co-collaborate co with the Bell Alton High School alumni in the near future is right around the corner. And finally, I would like... <laughs> yes, yes, thank you, Mr. Wills. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the heart work that I like to call that went into creating this program and this space to elevate the voices of our community. A special thank you goes out to Jack Tuttle, Social Studies Content Specialist with the Office of Teaching and Learning. Jack, where are you? With the Department of Community Engagement and Equity, we have Christine Paul, the Community Engagement and Equity Specialist. Ms. Paul. And also Jenny Hall, who is the Administrative Secretary to our department as well. And I think she's out greeting our guests. So a round of applause for the planning team. 
could not have done it without you all. So, at this time, I would like to invite Matt Nolan Wills, Chairman of the Bell Alton Alumni Association, to share special remarks. Mr. Wills. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Paula. I take it you can hear me? Okay. <laughs> My name is Matt Nolan Wills, and I am a 1962 graduate of the historic Bell Alton High School. And for the last three years, I've had the honor of serving as the chairman of the Bell Alton High School Alumni Association. And as chairman, and on behalf of our board of directors, I want to thank Superintendent Navarro for asking us to co-sponsor this evening's Black History Program. Thank you, Doctor. Some quick facts about Bell Alton High School. Stay with me now. One, as early as 1935, members of the colored community of Charles County lobbied the school board for a second high school for colored children on the eastern side of the county. We already had Pamunkey, but they were on the western side of the county. Two, in 1938, the Board of Education agreed to build the school in Bell Alton as long as the colored community paid for the land. And they did, okay? Keep in mind that this was during the Depression and the pre-World War II Jim Crow segregation era in Charles County. And that's where it was, folks. The three, the school cost about $25,000 to build, and it opened in September of 1938. The first graduating class was in 1939 with 12 students. Four, the school operated for 28 years before closing in 1966 after schools were integrated in Charles County. During that period, 69 teachers including Mrs. Marshall, <laughs> taught at Bell Alton, and 787 students graduated. Five, Bell Alton High School is the only colored high school built pre-World War II that remains fully intact today. It is the yellow stucco building located on the southbound side of 301 about four or five miles south of La Plata. You've probably gone by it a number of times and maybe you didn't know what it was. <laughs> After Charles County integrated schools in 1966, by the way, 12 years after the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision, the building was closed as a high school. And except for the relatively short period that it was used as a middle school, it remained vacant for over 20 years. During that time, the building was allowed to deteriorate to the point where the Charles County Board of Commissioners made plans to demolish it in the late 1980s. Fortunately, very fortunately, some Bell Alton High School alumni who later became founders of the Bell Alton High School Alumni Association were informed of the county's plans by Mrs. Salome Howard, a former teacher at Bell Alton and a civil rights activist in Charles County. The founding members met with the Board of Commissioners and convinced them to halt their demolition plans, raised $6 million to rehab the building, entered into a long-term lease with the county, and operated a community center at the site from 2008 to 2015. In 2015, the county evicted the Bell Alton High School Alumni Association from the building, claiming that we had violated the terms of the lease. We disagreed and took the county to court after nearly a two-year legal battle 
the county and the Bell Alton Alumni Association entered into a court-ordered settlement agreement, which, among other things, resulted in the association having two rooms in the county-owned building. In 2021, I was elected chairman of the Alumni Association. I took over from Mrs. Joan Jones, who had chaired the association since its inception in 1993. The new mission of the Bell Alton High School Alumni Association is to preserve, promote, and share the cultural history of the historic Bell Alton High School and the legacy of its students, teachers, and staff as well as the black community it served. We are sharing that legacy by participating in this program, by offering scholarships to Charles County public high school students, by supporting youth organizations like Beyond the Classroom. We had a great event down at the school last Saturday uh, in which we co-sponsored with uh, Lisa Ambers who is the leader of Beyond the Classroom, who does excellent work in this county. Um, and, and also, we are working to have the Bell Alton location placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, we've hired a consultant, and um, so we're on the way uh, to submitting our documents, our required documents for that designation. Uh, additionally, we sponsored a celebration of the 85th anniversary of Bell Alton High School last year. And it was at that time that I met Superintendent Navarro. Matter of fact, she was, if I recall correctly, she was the first person to buy a ticket. <laughs> she was. Um, and for that reason, when it came time to serve dinner, I gave her a special I treated her specially. I let her get in front of the line. <laughs> <laughs> Along with Miss Yonel <laughs> Morley and Miss Craver. Um, uh, in closing, I know those of you who know me are just shocked that I'm closing at this point. <laughs> but, <laughs> but in closing, <clears throat> the doors of our association are wide open. If you wish to help us with our mission, by becoming a member, please see me or a member of the board or go to bellaltonalumnicdc.org for a membership application. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Navarro for this opportunity to share the cultural history of Bell Alton High School with you all in the audience and the students of the Charles County Public School System. Finally, I would like to introduce you to two I think there are only two, two of the original founders of the Bell Alton High School Association. And if they're here this evening, Mrs. Mary E. Whalen, could you please stand? And Mr. Jerome Short, are you here? Okay, please stand. Without these two people, and the other, member, other founding members, folks, I can confidently say that that yellow stucco building five miles south of La Plata on Route 301 would not be in existence today. And you know why? Because people only preserve things that they care about. You know, if you don't care about it, why preserve it? Well. The Bell Alton High School Alumni Association and the black community of Charles County cared a lot about that building because it's our history. Okay, and we're going to work to make sure that it's kept in good shape. And, um, and we are, we're sort of like archangels looking over that building. And, and that's the way we see our role. So, um, also, I would just appreciate it very much if any other members of the Bell Alton High School Board of uh, Directors are here, they please stand real quick. Joseph Johnson, Lisa, Lisa Ambers, and I don't know who else. But at any rate, folks, that's my story, 
and I'm sticking to it. Amen. All right. God bless each and every one of you. Oh, by the way, uh, it, it, people always ask me, well, what do you take away from all of this? And just a couple of things. One is that when we went to Bell Alton High School, the first thing is that there was order in the classroom. There was order in the classroom. Parents, let alone the teachers, parents insisted on it. Okay. Um, the other thing is that the teachers, Mrs. Marshall, you expected a lot from us. You expected a lot from us. Okay? She, and, and that is so very important. And the last thing I'd like to say, and y'all could get on me later for this, but <laughs> please don't name any more schools in Charles County after anyone who enslaved black people in Charles County. Please don't do that anymore. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Wills. At this time, I would like to invite our superintendent, Dr. Maria Navarro, who will elaborate on the objective for the evening and introduce our student facilitator and our distinguished guests. Good evening, everybody. Good and I'm so glad that uh, to see all of you here and students. We just took a poll. We have uh, maybe close to 40 kids watching right now. They do have a homework assignment that's tied to this, and I'm sure that they're going to go back and uh, watch the recording if they're not watching live tied to their assignment. So I wanted to give the audience some context before I introduce the panel and really spend most of the time listening and learning as a community. Um, how, I, from my perspective, how this event came to be. I was very eager, I do think I, I did purchase the first ticket because I was very curious. When uh, Mr. Wills invited me to the um, 85th anniversary of the Bell Alton Alumni Association uh, that took place in October. And I and several of my board members attended um, and I thought, I was sitting in the room and saying, oh my goodness, I'm in the middle of living history. and. Um, I wonder how many of my students know the living history locally. Um, I'm an avid um, follower of uh, podcast. I use it when I'm cleaning the house, when I'm walking, when I'm driving. I love to listen to podcasts. And when I was sitting um, there at the celebration, uh, listening to so many people talk about the Bell Alton community, who they, uh, where are students, the impact of having attended Bell Alton, um, and also the teachers that taught at the school, um, it reminded me of a podcast that I listened to a while ago. Um, Malcolm Gladwell has a podcast. He actually just came out with a new series, and it's called Revisionist History. And in that, he talks about aspects of history that people don't have time or maybe don't know about and how they, in, um, that how they came to be. Um, and one of the episodes, it's called Miss Buchanan's Period of Adjustment. If you have an opportunity, Google Malcolm Gladwell and his episode, it's called Miss Buchanan's Period of, of Adjustment. The students that are sitting doing their assignment, either watching it now or before because of Jack Tuttle and his leadership, um, actually got a chance to listen to this podcast. This podcast talked about the unintended consequences of the Brown versus Board of Education um, when it came to be in the mid-1950s. And it talks about multiple aspects. Tomorrow morning, I'm sending an email to all of my school leaders and central office leaders, asking them to listen to this podcast with the lens of what is the responsibility for us educators, uh, teachers, principals, superintendents, directors, as we go back and our students, especially in this month, of the implications of history 
that today still linger in terms of the education of all of our students, but specifically our African-American students. And so tomorrow they're gonna to get an email from me, Lou, he's one of our principals sitting here that came, he's gonna get the email and he's gonna get a homework assignment. Because this is a month where we may celebrate the achievement of um, the African-American community in all aspects of our American culture, but this is also an opportunity for educators to continue their education. And so in Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, he talks about a lot of unintended consequences. And one of them spoke very clearly to me as I was sitting in this event. In school systems across the nation, one of the biggest things that we work towards is how do we bring more teachers of color to be in front of our students. And we do so because we have decades of research that say that teachers of color, because in their position of power in front of students, are able many, 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 many times over to support and highlight uh, students of color who are gifted, students who need to be supported. They also tend to um, support student behavior in a more positive way that does not negatively affect specifically our males of color. And so across the nation you will hear if you're an educator that all school systems are striving to get more teachers of color in front of their students. And this research began with African American, in the African American community, but it has extended and replicated to also see the positive impacts when you have uh, teachers, Latino uh, teachers in front uh, and supporting all students and the impact they have of students of color as well. And in Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, he highlights that when schools began to integrate, there was an impact on the vibrant numbers of black teachers that taught in black only schools at the time. So when you integrated schools, you may not have needed as many teachers. And one of the things that I will leave you with, hopefully as an appetizer for you to go search this podcast and listen to it yourself, is that he quotes that in the South, there were about 82,000 black teachers at the time when Brown versus Board of Education came to be. And when you look 10 years later, and in Charles County it took 12 years, and we'll hear a little bit about why that, that that implementation of, of federal law took so long. Um, but if you look at in the South, from that 82,000 teachers, 10 years later, about 50% of those teachers still remained as teachers. So one of the unintended consequences of Brown versus Board of Education was that when we integrated schools, we integrated students, but we didn't work to integrate the adults. And all of the systems that were in place um, showed their true colors. And so we lost thousands and thousands of teachers of color. And if you're like my family, where teaching is a family business, we now wonder why across this country today, we only have about 6.1% of teachers teaching today that are, te that are black teachers. We cut those pipelines, and now we as educators are starving to try to figure out how to rebuild them again. The other thing that I worked, that I walked away with that evening, and I was excited to think about this, and, it, and I'm so glad Mr. Wills took my call, and he gave me a little bit of hell um, there for a little bit. But what I was interested in is, so that's the experience nationally of integration. And when our students read the court case of Brown versus Board of Education, they can read about it and it can feel very distant to them. What I wanted to do is be able to create an, a, a panel conversation where we would bring people locally from Charles County that experienced this and make this and record this experience and their conversations and record it for our students today, but for our future students, so that when they learn about integration of schools, they have a local example. So I am very thankful 
that we have the opportunity to have living history teach us all today and teach future students about what it was like to integrate schools here in Charles County. Maybe we didn't lose as many teachers of color when the schools integrated. I don't know, but I'm going to find out today because I today am a student of the work just like you are here. So I just wanted to thank, again, Sylvia and Jack have been amazing organizing this opportunity. And I absolutely wanted to thank Mr. Wills who said, who understood that the purpose in coming together is so that we can get uh, an artifact that will allow our students of today and tomorrow to learn about the local history of such an important decision that was made and that everybody hears about and talks about, but can sometimes not personalize it. And today they will because they will hear from people who lived it. So with that, I'd like, you, I'd like to introduce you to our panel, uh, our panelists. Jean Will Stewart is a Bell Alton High School student. She attended Port Tobacco Elementary School from first grade through the sixth grade. She attended Bell Alton High School from the seventh through the 10th grade and later transferred to La Plata High School, completing her junior and senior years of high school. Ms. Stewart later attended and graduated from Lincoln Technical Institute as the only female in the top five percentile of her class. She is the co-owner and office manager of a family-owned HVAC and R company. And she is, she's very reluctant to use the word proud, but she's very pleased to have with, with, along with her husband, been part of a uh, growing family-owned business locally. Thank you. We can just welcome them. <laughs> Next is Mr. Robert Martin, who was also a Bell Alton High School student. Mr. Martin attended Wicomico Elementary School, Malcolm Junior High School, and Bell Alton High School and graduated in 1961. Mr. Martin attended Morgan State College, now university, and graduated with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. He also attended Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., where he received his Ph.D. in chemistry. He, fur he further attended the Archdiocese Art of Washington, and he became an ordained deacon in 2010, at which time he was assigned to St. Peter's Catholic Church in Waldorf, Maryland. Mr. Martin has held numerous professional experiences in the field of research chemistry to include serving as an adjunct professor of chemistry at the University of the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C. He is currently a consultant. Mr. Martin is most proud of graduating from high school, earning his bachelor's of science degree and then Ph.D. along with his family and friends. Thank you for being here. Ms. Cora Marshall, a Bell Alton High School teacher. I am so happy that you were able to come today. Ms. Cora Marshall attended Folks Road Elementary School and Greenwood High School in Maryland. She continued her education at Morgan State University where she earned her bachelor's degree in English and Social Studies. Her graduate studies took place at Howard University in Washington, D.C along with Georgetown University, also in D.C., where she, enter, she earned her master's degree in education and human development. Ms. Marshall has taught multiple subject areas during her tenure as a secondary educator and has served in a, in te in a teacher leadership role, um, including as a reading coordinator. She believes that as she looks back on her career as a teacher, she has been able to achieve her, pool, her full potential in service to mankind. Ms. St Stewart has been recognized with the Teacher of the Year Award and also for the Out Outstanding Dedication and Service Award for the Comprehensive Reading Program, among many others. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> and finally, because this is a learning opportunity, we have a student who will be facilitating our panel discussions today, Mr. Isaiah DeLeonard from uh, La Plata High School. He is the youth division, he's the president of the youth division of the Charles County branch of the NAACP. 
He was voluntold to be here. I don't think I gave him a choice. Um, he, is, he currently attends La Plata High School as an 11th grader and looks to pursue a four-year degree in music. He is so talented. He is a national level musician and composer winning gold and silver medals in AXO Nationals in 2022 and 2023 and participating in the Maryland All-Star All-State Junior Band in 2021. He also spoke at the NAACP uh, Martha Luther King breakfast in January, and I also saw him introduce uh, Governor Wes Moore at the NAACP Maryland State Convention in November. Thank you so much. And with that, I am gonna pass the baton to you to begin tonight's conversations. All right, let's get this show on. Can everybody hear me good? Closer. Now can everybody hear me good? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> Please tell us what high school you attended in Charles County and what it was like to be a student or teacher in an all African American school prior to the integration of schools in Charles County. Any of y'all can go first and <laughs> Well, like uh Dr. Navarro said, uh, I spent the seventh grade at Bell Alton High School, then transferred to Malcolm Junior High School for grades eight and nine, and then came back to, to Bell Alton High School for grades 10 through 12. It was really at Bell Alton High School where I really got my formation in education and the good works that got me to where I am today. Uh, my teachers were excellent. They were the best teachers, in, in my opinion, that anyone could encounter. They were always encouraging, supportive, watching out for you, and really made sure that you stayed on, on your even keel. As, as, as Nolan said, one of the things that they instilled in students at that time was indeed discipline. And basically, you had to know where you stood when it, when it came to each of the teachers. And I must, I must tell you this little uh, morsel that, I, that I encountered when I was in the seventh grade at Val, at Val Alton High School. I had an English teacher by the name of Mr. Henry Barber. And I think a couple of the other, other people here in the audience will, will recognize this. Mr. Barber was a teacher did not like people to use the word ain't, A-I-N apostrophe T. And if he heard you use that word, you had to write it one, a sentence 100 times, ain't there is no such word. <laughs> and basically you did that on line paper and you had to turn it into Mr. Barber and Mr. Barber would actually make certain that you wrote it 100 times. If not, you had to do it again. You learned quickly not to use the word ain't in Mr. Barber's class or any of the other classes that were, that were, taught, that were taught at Bell Alton High School. I thank, I thank all of my good teachers at Bell Alton High School and really the support that they gave me, encouraging me to go forward. And, and, and uh, Ms. Marshall, one of the last, quite frankly, surviving teachers from that, that, that time period, I guess Mrs. Vaughn may be one of them as well, but other than that, we, unfortunately, they Mrs. Won't. Sweat is the only other Mrs. one. Mrs. Sweat is there as the well. Only two of us. Only th two, of three of you, two, two or three. Less, two or three. Two, great. But uh, that w I really had that support and everything else to go forward. Thank, I thank them for everything that they did for me, and I really appreciate everything that the Alumni Association is doing now to keep Bell Alton's in the, in the news and so forth. Absolutely. Uh, if I may. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As I've said many times before, my first year teaching was at home at the high school from which I graduated. And then I came to uh, Charles County, 14 years at Bell Alton, uh, one year at Martin, mm -mm, up there in La Plata. Uh, Milton Summers. Milton Summers? Was it? No, in La Plata. Uh, Summers. Oh, Milton Summers. Milton, Milton Summers. Summers. Thank you. <laughs> I've aged quite a bit. I'm allowed to make these errors. <laughs> um, I integrated that school. And 
Genevieve S. Brown was the superintendent of school center, supervisor, I believe. I don't know why I was asked to go. I've never felt intimidated because I always felt like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> so maybe that was the reason. I don't know. Maybe that was the reason I was asked. But I went to, uh, I can't leave Bell Alton yet. <laughs> we cared about our students. Those parents, and they were parents. Those students knew you don't talk back. That's not your purpose for going to school. You are there to learn. They knew that. We didn't have any problems with our students. I know. I witnessed it. I taught them. Best kids ever. My best teaching years were Bell Alton High School. <laughs> Wonderful. The parents were so cooperative. The PTA president, Mr. Mosier Wells, and Miss Oak, what was that lady's name? She was a secretary. They loved those positions and they worked very hard and supported the teachers. I feel so sorry. Maybe that's not the right word, but my heart goes out. That is correct. To educators today, we have children, raising children. Half the time, they don't know where their children are. We didn't have to deal with any of that. It was a it was just a joy. It was a pleasure to wake up, get dressed, and go to work. Students during those days made our jobs easy. All we had to do was to be prepared and teach. They knew what they could do, and they knew what they couldn't do. I, I love, I love these children. I'm still hanging with them. Uh, my Uber driver tonight is Barbara Gray, <laughs> who was a student. I, she's somewhere in the audience, who uh, brought me here this evening. They still look out for me. They say women won't tell their ages. On Sunday, I will be 97. I would uh, like to sh hope I'm not talking too long. No. <laughs> uh, I'd like to share an incident with you uh, that happened at uh, Milton Summers. I think his name was Mr. Walter Johnson. I believe he was the principal. I can't think of the vice principal, but they were wonderful. There was only one teacher on that staff. If I walked into the teacher's lounge, she would walk out. Her very best friend on the staff was a home economics teacher. Her room was across the hall from mine. And she said to me, she is my friend. You don't worry about anything here. She has her own problems. Something else, and I'm going to get quiet. <laughs> uh, it was an honor when the principal asked me if it were all right for other teachers, I was the only black one on the staff now, if other teachers could come to my classroom to witness and to see how I worked with groups. I always grouped my students. Even today, all students do not learn at the same pace. You so you do what is best 
and my grouping techniques, I'm proud to talk about them because he asked me if it were, he would like to send some of the teachers on the staff to my classroom to observe how I did it. Oh, I can tell you some stories, but I'm going to hush because <laughs> other people need to talk. Oh, my goodness. Isn't she a fireball? Yes, yes. Such incentive. When I was, um, I attended Bell Alton and Dr. Navarro Bell Alton, not Alton, okay? <laughs> That's how we say it. <laughs> when I attended Bell Alton uh, High School, I, I, actually, it was junior high, and, you know, it was a preparatory time. Coming out of Port Tobacco Elementary, um, where the teachers really cared about you. If you did anything wrong, your mother knew it before you got home. If she wasn't home and she was at work, the next door neighbor, Miss Estelle, she knew, and she would be at the house waiting and all like that. So, you know, they all had rights over everybody else. But I just want to personally thank you, Ms. Cora Marshall, for being one of my very favorite teachers. She lit a fire in me, and she gave me that sense of go get them you know, to know who I am. And that was, a, it's still taking place though. I still am learning who I am. But we had respect for our teachers. Yes, it came from home and, and even we were farm children. You know, I come from a family of 13 siblings and we worked the farm. But we always had provisions. We, by the, uh, the world standard, we might have been this side of poor, but we never wanted for anything. And so I just want to thank you personally for all that you did. I mean, she made an imp and such an impact in my life. She and Mr. Shamo, you all know, remember Mr. Oh, Shamo. That was the hardest teacher. He was stern, but he was so good. And between her and him, they were my favorites. <laughs> you know, because they were hard and they didn't give you any slack, but you had to love and respect what they gave you because they could see beyond where you were, you know? And so, you kids were something else, so I think you the teachers, we took from home to school, yes ma'am, no ma'am, when we had to address them. We didn't call them by first name, and we didn't say yeah or no or yes or no. It was yes ma'am, no ma'am, yes sir, no sir. That was instilled in us at home, and we carried it through. And so I just want to thank you for that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is there were certain teachers. Mr. Washington was one. <laughs> and we had sort of an open house forum as far as the teachers, a, a revolving door. And I know at least two times out of a month he would show up at our house because he knew what mother was having for dinner. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and but they, they had that kind of relationship. They could drop by any time if they had any concerns about us. So it was like we had the family in Spring Hill, but the family was extended when I went to Bell Alton. And so for that, I want to thank you for your love, your support, and everything that you instilled in me. So Ms. Marshall, uh, you already answered my next question. <laughs> I know you've seen generation of oh, generations of students. I have a hearing problem. I'm sorry. Um, I know you've seen multiple generations of students come, come and go at the school and other other schools as well. But um, in terms of a student perspective, I want to ask uh, Mr. Martin and Ms. Stewart. Compared to the curriculum in school that we have today. How would you say that your educational environment and experiences was any, was any different? Uh, I'm going to let um, Ms. Stewart start. Oh, she needed to hear the question again. Just be, okay, I can, I can speak a little louder. Go ahead. Yeah. Before she... <clears throat> Compared to the curriculum in school that we have today, mm -hmm. how would you say that your educational environment and experience was any different? 
It's, it's, oh. <laughs> that's okay, Mr. Martin. It's really for the students, you and me. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. that. Y'all, yeah. I, I, I need to think for a minute. Uh, yeah. mm. I, look, when teachers, when I taught and started teaching, you were hired, you knew exactly what you were supposed to do, We were dedicated, and we did it. We did it. We loved the stu We knew what we were there for. We were there to teach. Parents sent their students to be taught. They knew that was happening in the schools. Uh, we could get back to some of that these days. Like I said, the teachers today are, they, they, they are up against it. They are. I mean, I'm so glad I'm retired. <laughs> I mean, okay, so okay. shooting in schools? Can you, can you believe it, really? Churches? Innocent kids on the street? Nine-year-old out in the street, one o'clock in the morning, robbing. Where was the mother, the father? It's a new day, people. I tell you, we need to get back. Uh, don't ask me how, but we need to get back to some of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think the question from a student's perspective was, how the curriculum was different. Do you want to know from the segregated to the integrated schools? Of course. I mean, okay. You're, All right. You're the best example of that. Okay. Um, I had wonderful teachers at Bell Alton, and I learned that I, I loved school. I really loved school, and I loved my teachers. They were always so supportive. But I was driven, and one of our teachers, my teacher, um, I don't know her, I can't remember her merit name, but it was Miss Nutter. She was hard and she was stern, but I just loved her. But anywho, she came to class one day and she put um, a problem on the blackboard. And she said, now, how would you solve that? And we looked at it and we analyzed it and, and we wanted to go up to the board and say, let's see now, do we divide, do we carry, whatever we do? And she said, stop. Let me tell you what they're teaching at La Plata High School. Analytical problems. You know, and, and she came at us with a whole different perspective. And she said, they have better equipment, they have better books, they have better things than what I can use to teach you all with. But that's what they have. And I would like for you all to have the same thing. Part two of lighting my fire. And so, that year, this was my um, 10th grade, and that summer, this was before the integration took place. This was the year before. You had to write to the Board of Education to ask them to allow you to go to an all-white school. And I did. I got my mother's permission, and I did, and they accepted. I had to go stand before them and explain why I felt I could or should go to that school. And I did. And I was admitted. But I did not see beyond what I was driven to do. And so when I went to La Plata High School my first day, it was a shock. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect. I just knew that there was something in that building that I wanted, I needed, and that I could use to be a better me. And little did I know, I mean, I knew in my head that I would be the, one of the few black students there, but I didn't know I would be the only one up in there. <laughs> and boy, did I feel <laughs> lost and alone. But you know, the school, the curriculum was great, the books were, brand new. We didn't have raggedy books up at La Plata. The, the laboratories were um, much more advanced 
for the science projects and all that kind of stuff. And the teachers were okay. I had a problem with a couple of teachers. My classmates were pretty okay. Now, I will tell you, I faced a lot of hardship and a lot of di division and a lot of resentment outside of my immediate class. But it was something I was driven to do. So I would say, I can't say one was better than the other because I got so much from Bell Alton that postured me to move forward and go to La Plata. And I used what I was given in order to advance forward at La Plata. Despite the unanimous U.S. Supreme Court ruling in 1954 declaring that separate facilities were not equal in the Brown versus Topeka Board of Education case, Charles County Public Schools remained segregated for over, an, for over a decade until the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Tell us about your experiences as schools began to be integrated in Charles County in the mid to late 1960s. So I know, Ms. Stewart, you probably already answered that question for us with... Um, Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, whoever wants to come up and tell their experiences first, just go ahead. Uh, well, uh, the school, like you said, the schools didn't integrate, didn't integrate Charles County until 1964. I graduated from Bell Alton High School in 1961 and then went forward to uh, Morgan State University. Uh, and uh, I just can only share some anecdotal information that I. Uh, picked up on uh, with the integration in Charles County at that particular time. But I, it, one of the things that I probably could mention here is that the, in 1958, it was when Russia put Sputnik up, sent that satellite up in, into space in 1958. And the United States at that time began to realize that we were behind in science and so forth. And that's when they uh, enacted what's called the National Defense of Education Act. And I th if I'm not mistaken, I think I may have been in about the seventh grade at that particular time. And at that time, I can recall t taking biology or something. Maybe it's a little later, but I was taking biology. And at that time, they threw a whole bunch of money into the whole system. And I can remember that we even got some frogs that came <laughs> to come in there so we could actually do a lab to dissect some frogs. And they began to realize that everybody had to be lifted up in science, the whole country, and that's when uh, further down the road, jo President Kennedy said that he wanted to put the man on the moon and we really got active in, in science for everybody so that we weren't being neglected in that, in that particular regard. But uh, I, after I got to Morgan, I uh, came back down to Bell Alton a couple of times to talk to students about college experiences and things like that. and. Uh, one of the teachers from Morgan who came down with, with us was, was, a, was a white guy. I can't think of his name right now. And we ended up going to a little restaurant in the Plata. And uh, we went into that restaurant and the, uh, we went and sat at a table and uh, the guy came and looked at the, the, the white guy and he looked at us and he was so sorry. He says, I'm sorry, but I can't serve you. And he was almost crying. I'm sorry, but I can't serve you. And this, well, this white guy was saying, well, what's the problem here? And somehow or other, we decided rather than to, make, to create a big fuss, we would just get up and leave. And, and, that, and that's where you, know, you really can feel that, that, that tension and that hate, but yet you don't want to hate because you realize that not only do you, do they, you have a, a problem, they also have a problem. And we're still, we're still struggling with that. We're still struggling with that. And it's, it's it, you know, you, you, what you, if, you, if you don't have it in your heart, you can forget it. This, this stuff about spe speaking that I love my brother and my sister and you don't feel it in your heart, I can tell you it's not real. So, so we really have to make certain that we are focusing on the right things Education is a life living experience. We are always learning, and we can't forget that. So, Mr. Martin, would you say, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so, would you say that, like, not only in the schools, but in just society as a whole, were people 
like scared of segregation or people didn't know what to say because like that example where they they um he said I'm sorry and you said and you said that he said that in a more nervous and regretful tone did you think that people didn't want segregation or do you think that there was only select people who didn't want that <laughs> in in Charles County at least the the impression that I think a lot of people had was that the people who were quote unquote our leaders were actually striving to sort of make things equal. When I was at Bell Alton, the idea was that, hey, our school was inferior to, I think at that time, La Plata and uh, the white school lackey. So that what they, stri what they strived to do was to make Bell Alton quote unquote equal. So they built a new gym at Bell Alton High School. Mm. We, prior to that time, we had a gym that was about half the size of a regulation gym and we played our basketball in that. They built an official gym and attached it on to Bell Alton. This is a big building that's hooked onto the side. And basically they started the, the, the mantra about, hey, you're, you're equal now because you got this new gym and so forth and so on. We got the same books because of this, all of this infusion of money that came through because of the National Defense Education Act. And this stuff was being driven from Washington, D.C., not so much by the people who were leading Charles County, but they were striving to try to say that if I can make them equal, we don't have to integrate. And remember that the South integrated before Charles County did. Mm -hmm. Arkansas, 1958, was when they had to take the National Guard to actually get blacks into the schools down there. We didn't integrate officially in Charles County until 1964. And, and, and what they were describing was, was, hey, look, you are equal now in your schools, or equal to ours. As a matter of fact, I think you may have built a new Pamunkey High School during that time to say, hey, now you've got a better school than our other schools and so forth. So, it, it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. It, 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 turned, it turns out that the, the leadership were, were satisfied and, and the people who were voting kept keeping them in there so that they were just stalling to, to say, hey, look, we don't have to integrate because we are equal, we, everything is equal. I'm, I'm, I, I have to divert. I'm a deacon in, in, in the Catholic Church right now. And the Catholic schools in, 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 in this part of the county, of, of the Archdiocese of Washington, did not integrate at the same time that the Catholic schools integrated in Washington, D.C. What happened was that the, the, the leaders, the white people who were leaders in the churches, the Catholic Church here in Southern Maryland, would go up to the bishop in Washington and say, we need a little bit more time, take some more time. And it turns out that it, they stalled so much that the Archbishop just gave up and says, hey, look, we're going to integrate. What was the solution? A lot of the Catholic schools in this area closed because they did not want to integrate. And, and, but again, it's, it's got to come from the heart. If it doesn't come from the heart, you've got a problem to start with. And that's, and that, and that's what happened in, in the Catholic Church. Now, it, 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 uh, the Catholic Church doesn't have as many schools as they used to have because in St. In Mary's County, we had some motivated uh, religious people who actually opened a couple of black sc schools in St. Mary's County to treat, to, because again, to exist during the segregated period of time. Um, Brothers and sisters, we have, we, have, we have a long ways to go in, in, this, in, in this era. And again, it's, it, it, if it doesn't come from the heart, we, we're in trouble. So both in the church, because I also went to a Catholic school myself, fifth through seventh grade. I went to Archbishop Neal in La Plata. Um, would you say that, um, so some backstory. There's a case, I'm pretty sure everybody knows it. It's, um, it was in the late 1800s. I don't know the exact name of the case, but they said a certain clause in there that really made an impact on the Jim Crow era during the early 1900s separate but equal is i'm sorry okay yeah plessy versus ferguson that's the one that i was thinking of a push trying to kick in um but would you say that sep like with especially with that new gym that you just said like you said now you're equal do you and this is for a question for all the panelists so anybody can answer this one do you think that during that time and even today do you think separate but equal still holds a big, big part in this county. 
yeah. Or at least no, in that I, part. I, I, part yeah, I, 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 I don't see th separate but equal as, as being part of the equation anymore. We, we, everybody has a free will, and if you live in an area where you, you uh, can go to take advantage of all of the opportunities that are presented in that area, it shouldn't make any difference whether you're white, black, blue, or brown, or, or whatever, what else. So I, I'm not sure that I can see separate but equal being part of the equation anymore. Well, in in the in the in the sixties and seven in the seventies, in Charles County, people t people were a, a lot more tolerant. But again, I I think we w we were focused to a large extent on your goals as opposed to amalgamation or anything like that. So that 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 probably drove a lot of that uh, complacency, if what people today would call complacency. But see, it, but see, during during my period when I was in college, it, it was a lot of black activism that was going on. But uh, I majored in chemistry, and, and <laughs> quite frankly, I, I didn't have a whole lot of time to be out there. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I'd like to add something <laughs> to that note. You know, we talk about separate but equal. The bottom line is, why are we even asking that? Why are we even there? Why God didn't make one race this color and one race that color. He made the human race. You know, and so I, I bet you our Lord is looking down saying, mm, 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 you just don't get it, do you? You know, so why can't we just come at any given situation as one? Okay, so we look different. I think that's like a garden. I wouldn't want a garden with all daisies or all roses, but it's a beautiful thing. Why can't we look at each other as fellow human beings? Yeah, we have a different culture. You look around the world, you have people on, in, in Asia, they have a different culture. In Africa, they have a different culture. There's so many uh, nations in, uh, uh, in Africa, countries in Africa. You know, in the North America, everybody has a different culture, but why can't we just act like what we were uh, made to be, human beings? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the thing is, what drives this is fear and greed. And when you fear something, you're afraid that you're going to lose what you think is the most important thing, and that's to be in first place. God made us supposedly in his image and likeness. Mm -hmm. And so why don't we act like that? You know, when I think about what I went through, I don't even know if I would do it again at 16 years old. Mm -hmm. But when I went to La Plata High School, yeah, I had, it was pretty easy in my classroom and with my fellow students. But when I was outside that classroom, just walking the hall, a balloon would be thrown in my face and I'd be wet all over. I'd go to the principal and say, do you see what he just did? And he shoots me off. Just go to your class. I, there was no regard for me. You know, you'd be sitting outside watching a game, and, and you know, outside watching a baseball game, and the guys would come up and just step on your hand and, and dare you to look at them, look back at them. You know, you go to the cafeteria and you want to sit and eat. They'll fold up the chair so you don't have a place to sit. What is that? So we need to get beyond that. We need to treat each other like God intended. You, you know, I, I, I can work with you as a white man. Hey, white and black. Okay, I can work with you. You're still my brother. I'm your sister. We have different cultures, but who's to say one culture is better than the other? However, where we are right now, you can look at the majority that holds the majority that's keeping the minority down. Okay, so why can't we just disperse with all this stuff? I, I don't take this the wrong way, mm -hmm. but Black History Month is a farce to me. Mm -hmm. I'm black 24 hours a day, 12 months a year. So why in the world would it be set up to give me the shortest month of the year? <laughs> but I mean, we need to really just put some things aside and just say, hey, it's a new day. Let's do something different to make a difference.
young fellow, if I may. We, I talked about uh, integrating the schools in Charles County. I would be remiss. I wasn't the only one. There were two of us. Those of you who live on Pamunkey side or whatever, Joseph Morton, mm -hmm. now deceased, was the other person. They had built a new industrial arts uh, school in La Plata. And that's where he was sent. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention yeah. there were two of us that year. I, uh, Joe Morton, and I. So for this final question, we're going to have all three in order um, answer the question. So we're going to start with um, we're going to start with Miss Marshall. We have in the audience, both in person and watching from home, students, teachers principals, and families that work and attend Charles County Public Schools? This is the question. What would be the takeaways that you would like us to have regarding this important time in the history of public education that you lived through and that you feel are very relevant lessons in today's schools? Tell me what he said. Yeah. I'm getting like, some help from him. <laughs> like, what lessons do you think will be learned? To students today, what would I pass on? Yes, ma'am. You should always remember that you go to school to learn. You should know why the teachers are there. The word respect should always be in the four front. That's all your parents ever wanted you to do. When I was teaching, you go to school, you obey. You knew better than not to, though. You didn't want the teacher to call the, your parents. <laughs> they didn't want the teachers to call your parents. You know, I have such pleasant memories of my 14 years at Bell Elton High School. I just loved being there. Going, I lived in DC, I commuted. I was, we carpooled, yeah. You know, I just can't say enough about the parents because on PTA night, <laughs> there were three or four families who always made sure that the teachers in that carpool had a full course dinner. The Chapmans, the Grays, the Browns, and forgive me, because I can't think of the other one, they cared about, we had worked all day. We didn't have to go to a restaurant to be denied. <laughs> we didn't have, the parents, the parents looked out for us. You do not forget. I'm still connected to these people I named. I told you my Uber driver was one of those families. <laughs> Barbara, where are you? I've been looking and I can't find you. Oh, <laughs> there she is. That was one of the families. Her parents. Oh, and those people that I named? Mm. Oh, I know the Brown family in Spring Hill or Spring something up there. That's gonna, right, Spring Hill, where the Wills George are. and <laughs> George had a sister. What's George's sister's name? Uh, uh, Mary Kathleen. <laughs> that, that's the other one. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, were, they were great, great. They memories. Mm -hmm. You know, but not only there, when I went to uh, Benjamin Stoddard Middle School in uh, Marlowe Heights, I was there, what, 26 years? I taught, I have 41 years service. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Parents, they had to stop a parent in the bathroom <laughs> for
from beating the child. They thought the parent was going to kill, I'm serious? Kill the child was yelling and the parent was whacking. They had to go in, the principal and another teacher, and get the parent off the child. They didn't play. They meant for you to go to school. They meant for you to be obedient. They meant for you to learn. We need those days again. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> that, that is so true. Yeah, I, yeah. The. I guess if I could pass on some advice or compare what I back in the day when I was at Bell Mountain versus today. The important thing I think is really to realize that you're in the classroom to learn, and you, you, that's your, that's your primary job is to learn and then move forward go forward from, from that position. But in today's society, there's so much stuff out here that can cause you to be detracted from uh, really what your purpose is. Being a student is your most important <coughs> job at, at the, at the, at during your teenage years. And you, you shouldn't have to worry about having to work Set two or three jobs that, like a lot of these kids do nowadays, going out and working at McDonald's and every place else just to get a car. You don't need a car in in high school. Your job is to to learn, study and learn, and then go forward from there. And while you're doing that, think about your career. The other thing is that as it, this is this is part of it, the history here. Obviously, the history is indeed 365 days a year, but. <laughs> If you don't know your history, you're, going to, you're bound to repeat the mistakes of the past. So you really have to learn your history. And that's part of, that's, again, that's part of your classroom learning. And you can learn history in every course that you take. It, it, you learn history in, in chemistry classes. You can learn history in biology classes. You can learn history in English classes and so forth. So you're always learning a little bit about history. But you've got to put all that stuff together and, and go forward. Today, though, I, I'm like Mrs. Marshall. Boy, I, 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 I see so many problems that seem to present themselves, and we look at the education system as being <coughs> the, the area that's going to solve those problems. And it's more than that. It is in the entire community, and parents and, 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 and the rest of the community have to play a role. And like she said, basically, in, in our day, you, you couldn't make too many mistakes or, or get into too much trouble because the trouble, the information would beat you home, get you get home before you did. Mm -hmm. so, so you learned in a hurry that you didn't want to go out and, and, and create problems and show disrespect to your teachers or any elder for that matter. So, to, but today I, 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 I commiserate with teachers because I, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of problems in the system. and. Uh, we, we, you know, I don't know all. The, I don't know what the solution is. To be honest with you. My takeaway from this is twofold. Integration is like a fast-moving train; it's not going to stop. Okay, and it won't stop until. You look at where we've come from, and you look at where we want to go, and you look at where we are right now. And right now is not where I want to be. Because when you look, you spoke about history. But had the history books changed for correction? How is it that I was taught that Christopher Columbus discovered America, and yet when they hit the shore, someone was already there? So how did they discover it? Please tell me that. You know, and the Native Americans have had to take a back seat. So now then you address us, I'm using your verbiage, African Americans, because you look at us and say we come from Africa. That's our heritage. That's where we come from. So then if you call me African American because I'm black, I can look at you and say, okay, then you're Euro-American. So why, why, why the distinction? Why the disparity? So my thing is, one of, and I'm going to put this out there, one of the worst things that happened to the public school system 
was that you took prayer out of school. You took prayer out of school, and that was like taking the cornerstone out of the structure. When you remove God from school, now what do our kids have to fall on? A lot of times when they came to school and you said the Lord's Prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance, that was the only time they got to pray. Sometimes, not always. But it was a time for them to hopefully grasp something that will help move them forward. And so, me personally, I know I am nothing without God. But when you took, you made a conscious decision to take one woman's strength to say, I don't want prayer in this school anymore. And you kowtowed to her and took prayer out of school. And where are we now? And so let's claim history as what God has called us to do. Let us make a difference this moment forward. We can't go back and, and relive history, but we can certainly do better stepping into tomorrow. And so I, I just thank you that we have teachers and administrators and, and parents and people that care about the next generation, like this young man. Oh my God, I mean, I just, I, I saw you on screen, but it's such a pleasure to meet such a fine, upstanding young man. And I'd take my head off, if I had one, to your parents. But I'm going to tell you, we, <laughs> we have so many, they mentioned it earlier, so many young people are lost. Uh -huh. and, and it's a sin and a shame. We have to take that on our shoulders because we're partly responsible. Yes, you have young people raising young people. And they don't know. You, you know, what day it is and all that kind of stuff. So I just said, let's take responsibility. Let's take a stance and let's make a difference. Gene, it still takes a village, doesn't it? Um, be, before we move on to the audience questions, I just want to say something that really does mean a, uh, a lot to me about, um, about how more integrative uh, curriculums are being established. So um, I'm in world history class. And um, the curriculum for world history is very European based. Mm -hmm. So we only spent like two weeks on Africa, right? So my teacher, Mr. Mr. William Finneran, he is an incredible teacher. He's an incredible teacher. He also teaches um, African American studies at my high school. He takes time out of his day. He takes time out of the curriculum to stray away a little bit from the European and, it might sound a little controversial, very whitewashed mm -hmm. curriculum that we have. Um, and he mixes in some of that, some like minority knowledge about it. And even though he's a white man, he still has respect for those minority communities. And I just want to say that, I mean, if he's watching right now, I just want to say like a really big, big thank you for teaching me new things and teaching me that there's that like not everything has to be about a certain people. There's a lot of different people who have done a lot of different things. And some of them are really important. Some of them shape the society that we have today. Like some good, some bad. And it's like, and if you're, and it's it's a little upsetting how how the curriculum fails to um, it fails to recognize that. So thank you, Mr. Fennerin, if you're watching for teaching me some new things, and it's definitely a big big thing for me. So thank you. Thank you very much. Please give our panelists a round of applause. Absolutely amazing. This conversation can't end tonight, it's obvious. I think many of us wanna to continue to listen and learn and, and ask questions and like Isaiah was saying, we did have an opportunity for some of our teachers and our, our students that are here today in person to ask a couple of questions. And so I think our next step is going to be how do we continue this conversation, not necessarily today, so we can honor everyone's time and space and family time this evening as they get ready for tomorrow, but to have that conversation to engage you on a continual basis. So, yes, Ms. Stewart. I would like to make a challenge. If, when you decide to 
my challenge. If when you decide to do a part two, when I went to La Plata my first year, I was the only black in my class. I know how I felt. I would like to know how my fellow students, all the white students felt. I would like to know why I don't see some white panelists up here. Because I didn't live it by myself. They had a part in it, and I would like to you know, interact and find out. This can't be a one-sided thing. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. So at this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Maria Navarro to close, close this up for the evening. It looks like we have our part two coming, so stay tuned. Um, thank you very much for uh, being open and for um, telling your stories and allowing not just the audience member here today, but many of our students to be able to have this session as they think about their current classes that they're taking and how your experience shapes and impacts what they heard. And I am hoping that our students, all of our students who are doing assignments tied to their work are able to go back and ask their grandparents questions uh, about that time. Because we also have a lot of history that's within our families. And the opportunity for the young generation to go back and ask their previous generations what was it like and what should I learn and what are some of the takeaways? I love the takeaway of this work. It's not just in schools, it's about community work. And I 100% agree that the momentum of a solid, strong community will dictate where we all land up and more importantly, where our youth will take us moving forward. So I wanna thank you so much. I wanna thank all the people that are here and I wanna thank very, very much the social studies teachers that came together to put an assignment that really could be meaningful for students to dissect and understand everything that they heard here today. And this is just the start of the work. And one of the things that I do want to say is Charles County Public Schools, and I told this to Mr. Wills, is committed, um, and I want to thank um, Mr. Tut Mr. Tuttle on this, um, is committed to bringing the voices of our local community in our history curriculum. We've been doing work here with the vibrant Native American community that's here and telling from their perspective a little bit about the history and we'll continue to do that with many sectors of the community, the community that's been here for many, many years and the community that is coming in and, and being part of the community of Charles County today. So thank you so much. It won't be the only time. And we have some gifts for our panelists that we will take the time to do that now as a small token of appreciation. Uh, I'm sure it has Charles County Public Schools written all over it. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you all for joining and coming in. We really do appreciate it. Stay tuned for part two. Thank you so very, very much. Have a good evening.